Thanks. So we've got Olivia, the amazing founder of Grub Club. So for those of you that don't know, Grub Club is essentially a booking platform for pop-up restaurants and you can discover rooms and other and, and, and sort of foodie events happening in kitchens across London. Um, Kiki Evans is the founder of A Great Night In and Kiki is sort of creating unique wine tasting experiences across the city. And we've got um, Bash Redford, the founder of Forza Win. And Bash started Forza after growing disillusioned with his marketing job. And after five years working for brands, festivals, and other people's awesome sounding events, he decided it was time to create his own. So I'm gonna let each of these um, say a, a little bit more about what they do, and uh, then we'll dive into the questions and open it up to the floor. <coughs> I guess I'm starting. Um, <laughs> so I'm Kiki. Um, I am actually one half of uh, a great night in. My business partner is Laura. Um, basically, just as Ross said, we create um, sort of interesting and interactive wine tasting events across London. Um, we kind of do two parts to our pop ups. We have um, sort of at home events where people can invite us into their homes and we'll host an event there. Or uh, we do also ticketed events. So whether it's um, a wine dinner, a pop up wine bar, we've done wine schools, all kind of different things, something, whatever it is, sort of event wise to do with wines, we're pretty much there. <coughs> Hello, uh, I'm Bash Redford. Uh, thanks for the introduction, by the way. That's great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So uh, I started a business called Falls of Win, uh, which initially started as a pizza supper club in my back garden, uh, but then ended up on a rooftop being a pizza supper club uh, that was shut down two weeks after opening because uh, it was illegal. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, now it is a um, very, very legal, very by the book uh, sort of pop up. Uh, we do large scale Italian dining halls basically. The idea being that you pay between 25, 30, or maybe sometimes 35 quid, uh, and that includes your entire meal. And that's not because we're an unsecure business, unable to sustain waste and things like that, just because we don't like waste. If we know how many people are coming, we know exactly how much food we need to cook, and we prefer that way of doing things. It also means that our business is you know, in quite a good situation most of the time, uh, where lots of restaurants aren't. So, uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah, you've got one. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so I'm Liv, uh, the co-founder of Grub Club. Um, and so we are a platform which showcases uh, pop-up restaurants and supper clubs. Um, so on the one hand, we help chefs uh, find venues if they need to and just sort of um, support them in trying to set up their food venture, which is then showcased on our website, and then diners come to look at our site to book interesting, uh, cool pop-ups such as these. Um, although Bash still refuses to work with us, so I'm still working on him. <laughs> oh, uh, so Bash, you spent five years working for other brands, street festivals, and before starting alone and then setting up project, you decided to take it on your, your own and go out there and do it. What made you take the jump from helping others to, to going as, a, as an entrepreneur? Uh, um, I don't really, I'm not a huge fan of sitting behind a desk, if I'm honest. And uh, I, I saw a lot of ideas that I thought I could do, but it sounds like I really love myself, but um, <laughs> it, I, I saw lots and lots of ideas that I thought I could do better myself. And yeah, I just, uh, I thought it, it would be a great idea. I was help. I was actually helping a guy called James Ramsden at the time set up this sub club, which became quite famous. Uh, and I, I did their PR and marketing. Don't worry about it. Uh, but yeah, it became quite well known. And they, uh, I helped him and kind of got the bug. And I worked in restaurants as a kid. I grew up in a hotel, and I was just like, I want to do this. Uh, and um, Liv, from Grub Club, you're sort of doing the opposite. You're empowering others and, and helping them once they set it up to get a great audience in there. How did you come up with the idea and go about launching the project? Um, so the idea was actually um, what sort of really crystallised the, uh, the fact that this needed to happen was the fact that there are really cool, amazing pop-up supper clubs all around London, but they were really difficult to find, quite sort of underground, and they felt like a really sort of exclusive thing. And when I finally found my first pop-up, I realised that actually they're really fun and inclusive and 
great thing and they're not at all kind of snobby and you don't have to be the kind of next to uh, Jay Rayner to know what sort of is in the food and stuff. Um, but actually, so they are such amazing experiences, but they are really difficult to find. So we thought it would be such an important thing to be able to build a platform where we can showcase these amazing dinners on the one hand, but also help the chefs to set them up on their side as well. And what do you think is different to a uh, sort of a, a pop-up restaurant experience based on a typical restaurant that you go in the high street? Um, so from a grub club perspective, what we do, uh, what we showcase is the What's different is the social element of it. So everyone's gonna, so contrary to a restaurant, you're gonna go into a restaurant with your friend, and then you're gonna sit at the table, just the two of you together, and then choose whatever menu and not talk to anyone else and leave. And actually through a supper club, you're actually joining a table of like-minded people, and you all arrive as strangers, and you all leave generally a little bit more inebriated as best friends at the end of the night. And actually, you know, in London, which is such a huge and diverse and amazing place, there's not many places where you can go and meet strangers and sort of become <coughs> friends with people who actually you know, have a lot in, in common with you. So that's what really differentiates it from a restaurant. Completely. And, and Keith, um, with what you're doing, how, tell us about the journey of setting up. And you started with a pop-up, right? Yeah. Um, well, basically, we're both um, trained in hospitality. We've worked in restaurants for years. and. I guess maybe similarly we kind of went well we can maybe do a bit differently we can do it maybe a bit better but certainly differently um, and particularly with wine there's still such a stigma about wine that we wanted to line it up make it a bit young and youthful again who is your audience that sort of comes to the um, it, it is kind of quite varied actually um, I guess we always thought it was going to be sort of young professionals our friends basically um, but we've had everyone from everywhere. We've, we once had some tourists from Norway who like specifically came and looked us up. It was really, really nice. <laughs> <laughs> <But, laughs> <laughs> 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 that was us. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I mean, yeah, we just always thought it would kind of be, you know, the 20 to 30 something, you know, that not married without kids, that's just looking for something to do in London. But we've had families, we've had grandparents, we've had everyone come and even and also with wine, you know, there's a whole sort of segment that thinks they know something about wine and there's a whole lot of people that don't feel like they know anything about wine, but we kind of seem to get a cross section of all of that. We have friends from the industry who are sommeliers who know something about wine, who yeah. come to our events and enjoy them. Amazing. But then we have people who, you know, don't even like wine that come to our events and enjoy wine by the end of it. So And as a journey of setting up, why do you think why was a pop-up sort of helpful? Why did it help you in that journey of, of beginning? Um, I mean, we basically start started off the back of the recession, so a pop-up for us was brilliant because we didn't need to have any money for it, basically. Um, you know, it, it was very easy to start up. Um, but as a, we've done it now for a few years, probably one of the best things for us is that we can test our ideas, we can try different things without kind of a massive impact on a permanent space. And we can kind of refine our ideas, find the exact place that we want to potentially maybe set up something. Um, so it's almost like a bit of market research that you actually make money from. So it, it's worked really well for us. Cool. And Bash, you, the sort of first um, supper club thing that you guys did, you got in P Pizza Pilgrims, right? And uh, Pizza Pilgrims started off as a pop up, they've now got a, a long term store. First of all, what the guys like to work with? And secondly, why do you think they're now going into long term? locations even though they originally were sort of starting with street food bag brands and, and pop up at the beginning um <clears throat> so the well the, you're slightly wrong there we started the, so we started the business together as in we were equal shareholders Amazing. The business. Cool. Um, so i basically went to them and said look i want to start a supper club in my back garden that has pizza and i was introduced to them by a friend of mine who's a food blogger and they i told them about my idea and they're like i really want to do this but then, cut a very long story short, we couldn't fit the pizza oven that they had on the back of their van through the gate. So we ended up on this rooftop building a pizza oven, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so to answer your question, um, do, so firstly, they were always going to, their vision was always to do what they are now doing. That was the plan from the minute go. Um, and they started in street food because, like uh, Kiki just said, it was, you know, it's a very sort of, um, low drag way of doing something. But do you think they would have been accepted as successful today if they hadn't done that? Because everyone knows about them. No, not, not at all. Like, they both worked in marketing. They both understood exactly what they were doing. Like, they went on that trip because 
that was a really interesting way of launching a brand. So you are saying that that would have been that that played a part in oh god yeah massive part of it and, and you know look at any other sort of pop up that goes permanent or street food brand that goes permanent now like we've just gone permanent we we now have our own premises um, and yeah a huge part of that is 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 getting that sort of mass behind you of you know the people who are interested in something a little less sort of normal for want of a better term um, so a, a, a weird night out basically. And Liz, is this, Liz, is this all a trend? Because you know, we're seeing people like Pizza Bill go into long-term stores, we're saying that was their vision anyway. How do pop-ups pop pop -up stay current and, and stay you know, exciting as we get used to them? So I think at the moment they're still a trend, but I actually see a really long-term vision for them in the sense that you know, they're filling this gap exactly like Bash and Kiki are talking about, which is providing a platform for food entrepreneurs, which was not there before. So when you're looking at the stats, uh, you know, there's no real hard stats, but you read so many different uh, reports about, you know, nine in 10 restaurants in London close within the first year of uh, starting up. That's because people don't have the chance to have the practice, the exposure, yeah. build their brand, you know, get all the operations into place, etc. So you end up having to, you know, until recently, there was just a massive gulf between I've got an idea, I want to set up my dream restaurant and just getting, you know, a million pound funding to be able to sort of set up the premises. So I, I see that to me as a really kind of important gap that has finally been filled, which is that platform to help you build your brand step by step in a much more kind of safe and secure way that means that those who reach the status of a permanent site yeah. is because they've actually built their brand and their concept steadily and sustainably the way through, so they're much more likely to then actually be successful when they're setting up permanently. So it'd be interesting in you know, five years' time to look at the stats and see what the restaurant closure rate is in five years' time, because that would be very different. In, in the same breath, I think there's a, a really sort of similar trend in to how, how products are brought to market generally. Like you said, it's a really interesting way to test a model in the same way that, say, Kickstarter is a really interesting way to test a model, you, you basically go to market and you say, this is what I want to do, how many of you like it? Okay, well, you can fund it. And, and that, that it, it, in, to all intents and purposes, it's exactly the same thing, just with food. So you're, you're creating a low-drag version of, of what, you want to, what you want to ultimately achieve and testing it without spending loads and loads of money or borrowing loads of money. It's interesting because from, uh, from our perspective, we're seeing some incredible foodie brands that are, that are launching with the intent to always be short term. So, for example, um, we had someone come to us recently and they were saying that there's more farmers markets today in the UK than Tesco superstores, and they're growing faster because there's this kudos of discovery and the audience wants to find out new things. When they're going on Crab Club, do you think that's what people are doing and why? And all these sites that are about finding things in that moment, they're about that audience going out and doing something that none of their friends have done. Absolutely, and I guess that's why I believe at the moment it is still in a, as a trend, because I think at the moment we're still in the state, it's still a very new concept overall, you know, when you look at the past sort of, you know, 20 years that they've not been around, pop-ups are a very recent trend. So in my mind at the moment, it's still the early adopters, and the early adopters are the ones who are excited about discovering something new and different and being those kind of, you know, first ones to, to try something out. So I do think there's a huge element to that. But as it becomes, also, you know, it's a bit of an unknown. So there's only certain people who are sort of inclined to take that risk of trying something a little bit different. You know, you still, the majority of people you meet in the street every day say, oh, you know, I showcase a website about supper clubs and pop-ups. And people are just like, well, you mean you just got to eat with strangers and kind yeah. of, you know, you know kind so, of a weird place. Kiki, I'm just starting out. It's my first foodie pop-up. And I'm going out to, uh, to launch my concept for the first time. Tell me the steps you think worked for you, and what advice you give the audience. Oh gosh! <laughs> so what was one of the first things? Yeah, you find a space on the pier, here, obviously, the and then you. Uh, what happens next? Yeah, I mean, um, space. I think is quite important. Um, making sure that it fits to what you can do um, and what you want to do. Uh, so whether it's an empty warehouse and you're going to build a kitchen in there, or if you want to have an existing sort of cafe or restaurant that's already got sort of fridges and things existing. Um, that's kind of quite a big thing to find that. Um, for us, um, sort of 
I, I do all the graphic design for us and the sort of just how it visually looks before you've got photos from the event, we always found it quite important. So that was kind of the next thing. And then just literally getting out there as soon as possible and starting to promote it. Um, using ticketing platforms like Grub Club is brilliant because they help you promote it and they know you as a person, they know you as a business. And they how want does your to be idea stand out against all those others on Grub Club? Well, I think we're quite lucky because we've got such a, a niche um, product because we're doing interesting wine tastings and um, there are a few sort of wine tasting companies coming through now. So, um, but it is really just, it is finding that little thing which is different about you. But I think as probably most restaurateurs, most food entrepreneurs will say, <coughs> it's about the quality of the ingredients at the end of the day and that it needs to be a good product. It needs to be a good offering. And when people find that, they love it and they want to come back again. And how do you keep it fresh every time you do something new? I think it just fresh? naturally it's being a pop-up, that is something that happens. Every time we move place, it's, it's going to be a bit different. It's got a different look. Um, you know, we have a slightly different concept every time that we sort of start a new series, whatever. That's, that's the whole point of pop-ups. What are some of those concepts? Um, so last Christmas, uh, we did a pop-up in Ballam, which was called Vinter Bar. It was a wine and cheese bar, basically, um, all sort of based around a ski theme and mountains and such. So we gave everyone rugs when they came in. Um, we've done Wine Wednesdays, which is uh, a Wednesdays pop-up in the summer. Um, basically, that will be based around a different theme of... Um, this year is all based around sort of holiday destinations, so we did... Um, uh, beaches was one month, so it was all wines and foods sort of that represent different beaches around the world. Off the beaten track, so we had weird, wonderful wines and weird ingredients. So just sort of every time that we've done things, it's just that little bit of a different menu or that little bit of a different idea that kind of does keep it fresh. And particularly with wine, people are kind of quite used to being in their dingy caves and, yeah. and you know, the very stereotypical wine bar. And because we are a pop-up, we kind of keep it fresh automatically because of that, because we're always doing something different and moving about. And, and Bash, what about you, Sue? Have you done, you did a similar thing with like launching new concepts around when you were doing the pop-ups, and now when you've got that long-term story, that long-term project, how do you keep it fresh and, and maybe keep the elements of the pop-up that you learned before in what you're doing in a long-term capacity? Um, well, we, we operate seasonally, so we're actually closed at the moment. Um, I think that's a that's a huge part of it. So we make a very very big point of a creating um, Italian food with English ingredients. So everything we get is is from the UK, is sourced from the UK, and it is cooked in Italian style. Uh, so that gives you the opportunity to essentially make such huge changes to your menu that yeah, it's it's all worth shouting about again. Essentially, uh, so for example, this summer we've been doing. A spiadini and spritz thing, which is essentially like you meet lots of delicious things on sticks, yeah, uh, and a spritz. And for twenty five quid, you just you sit at these huge tables and you get your part in this like massive sort of communal meal and lots of spritzes and everyone drinks wine and gets drunk and it's fun and there's some entertainment. Uh, this winter we're doing uh, fondue night, so it will be we did one before, so we had a. Uh, Probably my biggest regret ever, but we had a, a fondue restaurant on a rooftop in the coldest winter of, but on record, it was the winter of 2012, it was freezing. Um, but we went the best fondue restaurant in London, so we, lots and lots of people are, there are only five. I mean, yeah, this is a steep competition for that award. Uh, but yeah, so we're doing the fondue again this winter, sort of bigger, better, more refined. Um, on a rooftop? Not on a rooftop, no, uh, in a warehouse, uh, in, our, in our permanent home, and then we'll close in January and then we'll do it again and again and again and again. Cool. Uh, and Liv, I saw the paper a few weeks ago, and I don't know if you saw it, but there was that article about the, I don't know if anyone in the audience saw it, but about um, the last supper for people that are going on death row. Mm. And they were sort of saying, has the concept and the story of these foodie products gone too far? What are some of the wildest concepts that like what these guys are talking about, but you know, times a hundred? What are the, the crazy ones you've seen on Grub Club where you've gone? Uh, well, that's a really tricky one. Um, I mean, that is probably amongst the crazier ones that I've, I've seen. And uh, it's, I mean, it's a really, it's a really interesting one in terms of, because we only, we only accept on our site ones that we believe or will be 
exactly that we'd want to go to. Um, is that and on the side? No, and that, it was a really interesting one because it's that balance of thinking, you know, what would be really sort of popular with the with the you know the public, um, and also which ones interest me. And I think I would have found it an incredibly difficult decision to make if they'd actually come to us because it's it's pretty it's pretty controversial. So obviously it's great to get into press, but also it's you know really yeah, quite press hard. Have yeah. uh, you seen the tin can one? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty lame. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we. Um, <laughs> Guys, that back. The audience, apologies. Um, so we've got um, we've just taken a old men's toilets in an underground station that's been empty for 15 years and turned it into a restaurant, which is like opening in about two weeks. How important is the space for you guys? And is it like that? The wilder, the most, the more unusual it is, the better. Or actually, is it better to just have a more controversial kitchen, sort of high street location? Uh location I mean the venue is huge that's what kind of really helps set it apart and what really sort of excites people um, I think you know we have stuff in the clock tower and some pancreas and disused underground carriages um, they will all do very well for your loo we had one in the loo in it's very uh, great uh, <laughs> gentleman's toilet um, so I think it's really that's what kind of makes it extra exciting so I think fundamentally you have to have a really great concept with really good food good ingredients uh, really good hosting I think the actual hosting side of it is really important but essentially you know people make their decision within seconds when they're looking at you know what experience to browse and I think the venue is, is, is really key and that's the best space you've ever launched a restaurant um, probably the <coughs> rooftop. The first rooftop we ever did was amazing. It, it, it was illegal and it was shut down, but um, it was absolutely phenomenal. Like, it, was, it just had the most incredible view you've ever seen. Um, second best is the I, I now own the pub below it, but it was one that looks out over the sort of uh, Hawksmoor Church and Spitalfields. That was pretty beautiful. Cool. Yeah, but on that on that um, the public space, space. thing, I yeah. think it's quite interesting thing for you, I don't know if any of you actually work in property or have spaces like this, but there's been a very interesting shift from my perspective in that you are starting to see as somebody who operates within these spaces um, a premium attached to more obscure spaces. Uh, and that actually is sort of contradictory to where this whole scene started. Um, the idea behind a lot of what you know, what what this kind of stuff is, and what it does, um, is because people couldn't necessarily afford to, or didn't want to, fork out for you know an enormous amount of money for a restaurant, four walls, and a kitchen. So they went to places that were you know not necessarily used for that, um, but could be used with back for that on temporary events notices and such. Uh, now you're starting to see like I was I, is you, is the one in, is it in Old Street? The, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so now you're starting to see a lot of these spaces sort of marketed by people for really quite a lot of money, and that kind of, you know, so that's a lot of these people out. I think it's interesting, but I think the point that Liz just made is that actually the more obscure the space, the better the audience, the more they want to go there, the more that that's playing a part in the value that the restaurants are curating. And interestingly, with Old Street, that particular space is is less than sort of half of what the rent is for the new development for Bower. Mm -hmm. And you sort of think, would someone prefer to eat in a typical glass fronted restaurant in the Bower, or do they want to go in an underground obscure space? And I think what we're getting from this panel is actually the audience today want the more unusual. Um, do you, would you agree, Kiki? Um, I think actually it's quite seasonal as well. <laughs> in the summer, no one's going to want to go downstairs. So that's where the rooftop is amazing in the summer. Place. But coming into winter, then you know anything which is underground, which is a bit sort of a bit more a smaller space, a tighter space, people kind of go for that. So just as much as uh, our menus and our pop ups are seasonal, our spaces can kind of be that's seasonal exactly. as well. Yeah, so idea. that's what's really cool about being a pop up. But um, saying that, I do agree with Liv that people kind of love having unique, weird spaces, and that kind of adds to the atmosphere. Absolutely. And, you know, it challenges people's preconception of what a restaurant or a wine bar, whatever that is. You know, if you're rocking up in a gents mm -hmm. loose, then you know, are you a wine bar or what? You yeah, know, and, it's and kind of blurs. It's severely clean. Don't worry, it has to. <laughs> so we've got about a minute left. Is there any questions from the audience before we wrap this up? Go ahead. <laughs> um, 
I was just wondering, because it's interesting how you said that premiums are going up massively on these interesting properties, but they came out of the startup scene. Being a startup, obviously, finances are insanely tight. Um, and now you guys are established. When you, it, kind of twofold, when you started, were you kind of collaborating with other people? I know you, you mentioned you were collaborating with Peter Pilgrim guys, but how much did you rely on other people? And do you also still kind of like to collaborate with the with the new startups of, of today, whether they're in like the food industry or, or not? Yeah. Do you? Uh, uh, so so it's it's right now, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yes, is a, is a, uh, yeah. I'm. We, funnily enough, Kiki's doing one as well on Sunday, but we sort of talk at uh, Guardian Masterclasses about how to do startups, and out of that comes a lot. I actually invest in a few as well at the moment, uh, and like ideas that I think are good, and help them on that journey, because it is difficult. Like, it's not the easiest thing in the world, and so to have somebody who's done it uh, is, is definitely a big help. I didn't have that when I was starting, and I got shut down. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a really sort of, yeah, yes is the answer. Any more questions? I can Go just ahead. add something onto that. Um, when we first started out, um, we actually thought that we were going to be more of a private event space company, not so much a pop-up, and that kind of almost accidentally happened. But basically we walked into a bar in Brixton and went, you're new, you look really cool, would you be interested in having wine tastings here? And they went, oh, we were actually talking about that yesterday. And so we actually got given the space for free just because they knew that we'd bring extra people to them and that meant something else that they could offer that they couldn't offer as it is. And um, we still do um, a, a wine dinner in Clapham, which we've done now for a couple of years, which we collaborate with a, a restaurant. We bring the wine and they do the food, but basically it's a brilliant PR for both of us because we were introducing each other to new customers. So um, particularly for food, I mean, I, that's probably the only experience I can really talk about is that actually walking into existing businesses and asking them if they would be interested in having your services or skills as added to what they already offer is a really good way just to get started. And it doesn't really, it generally it doesn't cost you any money because if you split a ticket cost or something with them, then that that's, covers their costs and they're more than happy to do that. Because we're not, we're not um, launching food and drink. It's retail, yeah. But it's kind of like the craft beer scene at the moment. It's getting massive, and you see lots of fusion between these different brands. So, uh, Rob Club actually, we've got in contact with you guys, but it was something that we were definitely thinking of. But yeah, definitely. Just, I think yeah. anyone um, who is starting out does look for like-minded people and people that are in a similar position. And it doesn't really matter what industry you're in, um, but people are always keen to. You'll be surprised by how many people are actually wanting willing you to succeed, and that it, just by meeting people at events like this, um, you will make so many connections, and even things that you haven't thought of yet will start to happen, so yeah, definitely. And actually just one little thing, <laughs> just to follow up from, from Kiki's point, which is the fact that in terms of wanting other people to succeed, you know, it's still a very new and niche scene, and I think that everyone realizes within this scene that the more people know about it generally, the more everyone benefits from it. So it is actually to everyone's advantage, those who sort of think more long term, uh, to all help each other out because there's so much space for the whole movement to grow that everyone benefits from helping each other out. 